I would like to thank, first of all, Mr. Walton for kindly inviting me to this conference, and I'm much honored to be with you today. So, um, uh, myself, okay, these guys at Trans Nation and uh, Richard Burton's pilgrimage to Mecca and, and Medina. Uh, so, Burton described his first setting foot in, in Alexandria with a sense of relish in his disguise as a Persian. I put the quotations on the computer. Uh, having been invited to start from the house of a kind friend, Don John W. Larkin, I disembarked with him and rejoiced to see that by dint of a beard and a shaven head, I had succeeded like the, like, like the Lord of Guiche in misleading the inquisitive spirit of the populace. The mingled herd of spectators before whom we passed in review on the landing place, hearing an audible Alhamdulillah, whispered Muslim, the infant population spared me the compliments usually addressed to hatted heads, and when a little boy, presuming that the occasion might possibly open the hand of generosity, looked in my face and exclaimed, Bakshish, he obtained in reply a uh, mefish, which convinced the bystanders that the sheepskin covered a real sheep. <laughs> Burton's account, uh, so, uh, sorry, so we see that there are always footnotes in, uh, here. We, uh, I, ha I cut the footnotes because they were very long, uh, but it, uh, much of Burton's book <coughs> looks like sometimes a, a movie with subtitles, and all the uh, translations are in footnotes, uh, also in the text itself. So um, Burton's ac account demonstrates that the sheepskin analogy is about costume as well as language. The very existence and authenticity of the actor impersonator depends on the linguistic competence of the narrator translator, whose talent in bridging two languages reveals the effectiveness of the disguise and the authenticity of the sheep skin. Burton elaborates and embeds in the narrative a rich bilingual dictionary from Arabic to English, whether in the form of footnotes or in the text itself. He deliberately chooses not to directly incorporate the translation in the narrative, but instead produces a transcription of the Arabic word or phrase before providing the translation. The following example shows this. I stood twirling the paper in my hands and looking very humble and very persevering till a loud Ruhi Akel, go O dog, converted into a responsive curse the little, speech, the little speech I was preparing. The constant reference to the original Arabic sounds makes the reader aware of the role and the authority of the narrator translator as mediator, sliding as effortlessly between languages as the character actor between impersonations. <coughs> One of the reasons of this thought, uh, sorry, of this ease is the sort of free license Burton enjoys. After abandoning the persona of a Persian dervish, he settles for an identity that his fellow uh, pilgrims, who are Arabs, cannot have uh, an exact idea of that of a Pathan and an Afghan from India, that is, they're not exactly Indian and not completely uh, uh, Afghan. He tells the reader that a man from Kabul is allowed to say and do strange things. He thus relies on <coughs> improvisation. Attempting to make an impression, he incongruously asks for food in the middle of an attack by robbers, stating that such is the, cust the custom in his country. But the divided reaction between amusement and displeasure makes him realize the riskiness of his strategy. Sometimes he senses that his companions may smell a rat. Another strategy used by Burton as a writer is his translation of the parts related to excision in Latin, into Latin. This serves to disguise the crudity of the matter by covering it with the medical connotations that Latin conveys. Burton tricks the Victorian reader and lets him know that he is tricking him. He presents a huge work of cultural translation from a source culture of which the Victorian reader is almost ignorant. Let's say, just as he as he's performing the, ro the role of a, of a Pathan for the Arabs, and they don't know much about Pathans, it's same thing for the Victorian readers. He's translating to them a, hu a huge culture of which they do not have an exact idea. When he describes Bedawi women, he makes a sort of authorial intrusion, stating, and I warn all men that if they run to El Hijaz in search of the charming face which appears in my sketchbook as a better we go, they would be bitterly disappointed. The dress was Arab, but it was worn by a fairy of the West. <laughs> the ensuing confusion between authenticity and disguise 
is interesting in that this particular picture appears as the frontispiece to volume two of uh, the second edition of a pilgrimage to Mecca. And this playfully alerts the reader as to the role of the cover as a sheep skin used to lure Victorian readers and hints at the possible tricks and forms of disguise hidden in his multi-layered narrative. But uh, as we read the, the narrative, it turns out that the sheepskin, after all, can transform whatever it hides into a real sheep. La bille fait le moine, as the French don't say. Uh, the narrative <laughs> dwells on costumes and often shows that the costume or role can alter the identity of the wearer or the actor. So uh, when the caravan arrives at Al Medina and Sheikh Hamid discards his rats for a stupendous <coughs> costume, Burton is astonished at the, I quote, the metamorphosis, and notes that the Sheikh's manners have changed with his garments from the vulgar and boisterous to a certain state courtesy. But the most spectacular metamorphosis of all is that of Burton into Abdullah. Clothed in Eastern dress, he sometimes genuinely becomes what he initially only pretends to be. The following disconcerting statement is an example. He says, the passport system's good effects claim for it our respect. Still, we cannot but lament its inconvenience. We, I mean real Easterns. So elsewhere in the narrative, the word we refers to himself and other pilgrims or Easterns with their common feelings, joys, hardships, and collective flirtation with a fellow female pilgrim suggesting that Abdullah has, in fact, obliterated Burton. If the man of action, the, um, the impersonator, is subject to such confusion regarding his identity, then the man of thought, the narrated translator, seems by contrast to be as scientific and rigorous as the dictionary he embeds in the narrative. Comfortably sitting astride two languages, he sometimes Englishes the Arab world to use a verb invented by Burton. So, um, Examples of this uh, sort of domestication of the Arab language, we have the mosque for Mohammedan church, Bismillah for the Muslim, uh, sorry, um, Muslim grace for Bismillah, and he calls a woman of some standing as the Lady Maryam. At other times, he borrows Arabic words that he incorporates into the English grammatical structure, like to nach, to make the camel knee, or to halal, to butcher according to the Islamic tradition. A certain inconsistency, inconsistency appears in his use of inverted commas. Regarding English and Arabic words, the typographical distinction between a foreign and a natural idiom is inverted, as in the description Burton, of Burton's attempt to persuade officials in Egypt to give him a passport show. Ma'adri, don't know, growled the man of authority without moving anything but the quantity of tongue absolutely necessary for articulation. Uh, so, the, what is the quotation marks is the English translation and the Arabic word or expression. He teases the reader further by using untranslated and therefore unintelligible Arabic words, and this in contrast with his in eagerness to encyclopedically translate almost everything from the Quran to the language used for guiding camels. Uh, so, there is a regular language to camels. If if makes them kneel, ya ya urges them on, hi hi induces caution, and so on. So uh, by contrast with his eagerness to translate even the animals used to guide camels, uh, we find other examples of untranslated untranslated Arabic words. Uh, for example, others again dislike the latter formula, declaring the prophet too venerable to be so visited by Amr, and say. Uh, Hammer and he doesn't explain. He doesn't uh, explain the, 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 uh, the expression. Actually, Hammer and Zaid are common names like Paul and John, and uh, it means you, uh, uh, the prophet shouldn't be visited by anyone. Uh, but actually, the it should be the other way around. The, the right expression in Arabic is Zaid and Hammer. Uh, then a favorite trick is to change Radi Allahu An. May Allah be satisfied with him. This last word is not to be found in Richardson, but any Luti from Shiraz or Isfahan can make it intelligible to the curious linguist. So we have two words, Luti and An, that he does not translate. Luti means um, homosexual. Uh, I, I couldn't 
understand, but I think it, the, whole, the whole thing is, is an, must be an obscenity or something. <laughs> Actually, it's <been> shit. <laughs> okay, we can guess. Not only does the Burton use transcribed Arabic words with no translation, but also words written in the impenetrable Arabic scripts. For example, this quotas is not a little increased by a truly better we habit of washing the locks <coughs> with bull and ibn, which is the urine of camels, but he doesn't translate it. So, well, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must be perplexing to be left just with uh, Arabic. So the use of Arabic and the absence of translation hint at the narrator's trickiness. His ultimate disguise is Abdullah, an Eastern to whom the natural idiom is Arabic. I think this is it by, pre by just speaking Arabic and uh, yeah, presenting the reader with Arabic words that he does not translate. It's as if you were assuming the disguise of Abdullah, for whom the natural language is Arabic. By employing Arabic words, he uses the same process of mystification described in the first quotation, uh, except that now the Victorian readers are the bystanders and the infant population he tricked in Alexandria. Another marked use of the Arabic script lies in the epigraph. This is the epigraph. And in the three editions he issued in his lifetime, Burton did not translate the epigraph. Actually, he did translate it in his chapter about Ad -Badawi, ba the Badawis of al hijaz but he didn't say that it is a translation of the epigraph. So the significance of this line by Al-Mutanabbi, here it appears as two lines, but in reality, in origin, it's just one line separated by space. It's like in, uh, for old uh, English poetry, there is also this uh, structure of the line being divided into two parts with a space in between. So it's, it's one line that Burton chose to present as two lines. So this, the significance of this line by, by Al-Mutanabi as one of the greatest lines in Arabic poetry, celebrating the desert and the heroism of the wandering poet warrior, lies in its encoding of a private affiliation that hints at how personal, personal, I'm referring to the title of uh, the pilgrimage, his personal narrative, how personal his narrative may be. Burton's hidden translation, hidden because he didn't say that it's a translation. So Burton's hidden translation of the epigraph is as follows. So this is the translation. Uh, I am known to the knight, the wide and the steed, to the guest and the sword, to the paper and read. Uh, so it's a nice translation, but unfortunately much gets lost when translating old Arabic poetry. But it's a very uh, nice translation, I find. So this line has a resonance with the narrative itself and also <coughs> with Burton's poem, The Qasida, that he disguised as a translation later when he published it. He said, I did not write it. It's by Abdullah Al-Yazdi, and I just translated it. So this line has a resonance with the narrative itself and also with Burton's poem, The Qasida, and as such expresses Burton's desire to situate himself in the line of the pre-Islamic long-standing tradition of wandering poet warriors who celebrated the desert and faced with its disorienting, shifting landscape, sought a home in their poetry. And indeed in Arabic, the word for, uh, for line is, is bait, and bait means home. Despite Burton's use of the words masquerade and comedy to describe his pilgrimage, irony and humor sometimes give way to moments of deep, aesthetic, almost spiritual appreciation of the desert. It was a desert peopled with echoes, only with echoes, a place of death for what little there is to die in it, a wilderness where, to use my companion's phrase, <coughs> there is nothing but he, nature sculpted, flayed, discovered all her skeleton to the gazer's eye. In a narrative about disguise and duplicity, the utmost nakedness of nature represents the desert page for the poet's pen, a moment of mystical contemplation and absolute silence where he can hear his poems tinkling of the camel's bell. Thank you. Hmm.